Every day, Scotland's fishermen head out to sea, hunting the fish that go on your dinner plate. Quite a few fish suppers there, I would say. Look at that. Spend all week looking for that. Whoa, much already. Risking their lives in Britain's most dangerous occupation. Oh, no, 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 no. We've now got a Sowie's gale up on us. For these fishermen, every haul is a gamble. No, no, really bad haul. That's a beauty. Woo! Do a little dance. Coming home to land their catch at one of Europe's biggest fishing ports, Peterhead. Here, the competition is fierce. 125, 130, 135. No, good deal. So will they strike it big or return empty handed? It's spring on Scotland's northeast coast, and Peterhead's newest trawler is heading out to sea. Westro, named after owner and skipper James West. Say goodbye to Peterhead. We're going to head north probably about maybe 50 or 60 miles, an area called the Skate Hole. A trawler tough enough for the North Sea doesn't come cheap. The Westro cost James over two million pounds. Well, it's a huge financial investment, but it's the, the, the bigger investment is time you're about to put into it because it, you're investing your next 10 years of your life to pretty much living Westro. You've got to get every day it counts when you're there. That's what I see about the fishing. James is on the hunt for a high-priced catch, prawns. At his side to help is another member of the West family. This is uh, my younger brother, Stephen. He's uh, second in command here. Stephen's 19, and he's just waiting on his paperwork to be able to uh, take this thing to sea. Ah, uh, yes, I know I can. Maybe I'm waiting on his paperwork to get me out the road. Uh, so very soon, Stephen's going to be alternating with me. He's, we've got him trained up already, and he'll be able to share the kind of load of taking this thing to sea. So I'm kind of second in command to him, kind of keeping things organised for him. He's good at like showing me the way he's thought about stuff and where even to where you go and stuff like that. Ken, there's always thinking behind it, and he's, he takes time to show me up and probably going to be a big help to me if I have to do it myself. Ken. It is all work when we're there and we have to get our work done, but at the same time, it's like anybody else. You can be having kind of discussions about family, and it's nice to have that. The Westro isn't the only boat hunting prawns. Up the coast in Fraserburgh, the Zenith is ready to set sail. This trip, they have a new crew member on board. Hello. Yeah, uh, I'm Adam, I'm Skipper. Nice to meet you, I'm Ashling. I hope you haven't got too much stuff. I uh, know, I packed that late, honestly. Oh, well, that's good then. <laughs> There's a weird um, superstition about taking women away, that you're bad luck and things like that, but by the time you get on board and start doing your work and lifting baskets and whatnot and fi finding that you're not going to be seasick every day, <laughs> then they're generally fine. <laughs> Ashling won't be fishing. She's a scientist, working as an observer for the Scottish Fishermen's Federation. Oh, oh wait. It's got the kitchen sink in it, you know? The point of my job is to basically collect data on stocks for stock analysis. And then all the data that we collect goes to Europe to inform them how productive Scottish seas actually are. Skipper Adam is planning to fish just 15 miles out in the North Sea. He's had a good catch there before, but there is no guarantee in fishing. Just hoping just the trans is jumping. It's my main worry here right now. Full there, I can full the boxes quick. Every fishing trip's a gamble, and some people might think Adam's taking a further risk by having Ashling on board. Oh, it's a myth, really. It's bad luck to have women on the boat, but, yeah, uh, <laughs> I take my chances, then. <laughs> people just think that you're going to have problems or 
they get a catch much, you know, just stupid stuff like that. But as a skipper, you always look for someone or something to blame. <laughs> the only thing is, you have a scapegoat. Like, you get poor balls, it's my fault. Yo, something yeah, yeah. breaks, it's my fault. And then I may, maybe just partially split the blame 50-50. Oh, that'd see be what nice. happens. Further out to sea, on board the Westro, James has run into trouble. And I'm not really sure what's happened. I haven't felt anything on the engine, but we've got the propeller camera looking at the time, and we've got something in front. Well, the worst case scenario, you could do a huge amount of damage, and that can be incredibly expensive on, you've got to repair it. But one of the things that can be expensive for us is losing time, because we are self-employed, if you're not going to see, you're not earning. And I've got a couple of options on it. Either leave it, just watch it, because it's not affecting it, or try and thrash it out. But that's pretty, pretty risky because we're towing just now. So I might just have to leave it until the haul. With no other option, James has to watch and wait to see if the rope breaks free on its own. I don't want to, I don't want to see it, but yeah, you. For Peterhead's trawlermen, hanging up their oil skins needn't mean leaving the industry. Former fisherman Stephen Bruce has launched his own business, working as a fishmonger. I always said I wanted to give people fish like we ate when I was on the boat, because we always ate the freshest of fish. Every day, Stephen sells the best of the day's catch from his van, getting up at four in the morning to tell his customers when he'll be in their village. My schedule is quite tight, but I usually manage to keep to it. Again, you get used to it. My lemon sole, my halibut, and my monkfish well here be filleted this morning. So my staff come in about half past six. So there will be a rush to get the fish out with the van about nine o'clock this morning. To stock his van, Stephen needs to buy his fish fresh from today's market in Peterhead. My reputation has been built up on really good quality fish. So that's what I want, again. Fifteen miles out to sea, the Zenith has been trawling for the past four hours. I'll just take the nets aboard first of all and other things, so I'll just uh, see how it goes. I hope I've made the right move. If I haven't, then I'll probably just have to move on, I think. These fishing grounds are notoriously hit and miss. If Adam's hunch is right, he could be in for a big catch. Sometimes you just have to try something because it gets stuck in your head and you're just like, oh, well, You've got to try it or it's just going to drive you insane and then it ends up somebody else tries it and it works for them so you're just better to carry out your mind sometimes. And it's good news for Adam. Ooh, mama hoochie. It's looking okay, bit of jump through it. It was a gamble. I wouldn't say it's paid off, but it's not a blank, so I'm pleased to say a blank. Below deck, Ashling can start her research. When I'm doing a fish haul, I collect two baskets um, of this part. So these are kind of things that are either like too small to go to market, or there's like no real market for them. So we collect that information as part of the stock assessment. See so many fish, you kind of know what they are by the shape of them. Um, it's not the most scientific means of telling it, apart from all the others, but lemon so have really kissy lips. <laughs> Ashling also needs to check the age of the fish by collecting a piece of bone called an otolith. We collect the otolith, and this is a cod. You cut into their head, under the brain, you'll find an otolith. They go back to Marine Scotland's lab and then under a microscope they'll read the rings to figure out how old they are. Because even though you can get two fish that look the same length, they can actually be different ages. The more information that we have about the stocks, the more 
confidence we can have going forward about reliability of what our stocks are looking like. And the more science can inform policy, the better results there is for the fishermen. So we can truly reflect what's actually happening in the seas. On the Westro, the crew are scraping by on small catches. Daniel, I have the winch. So they must work late into the night to maximize their fishing time. But working in the dark can be dangerous and Skipper James needs to stay alert. Well, this is gonna be the crucial moment. So I'm gonna have to watch, because here comes the clump. It weighs a ton. So I want to keep everybody out of the way, get them pulled up tight, break up the start up, and once they're up, pulled tight, everybody can do their jobs at that. Port side. So everything's a little bit more dangerous at night and I just want it to be repetitive, because the minute it steps out of the repetitiveness and something becomes a little bit uh, unnormal, or they do have to do something a bit different, you've added in a danger. It's a bit better. Not big, not overly exciting, but it's a bit better. You can just be in an area and the grounds can change. The prawns are always here. They're always on in, the, in the area, but just whether they come out their holes, they can just go for 10 boxes a hole to 20 boxes, and then that's where you start to mark a difference. Most of Scotland's North Sea catch ends up here in Peterhead, where some of the biggest buyers in town compete for the finest fish. Going head to head with these major dealers is local fishmonger Stephen Bruce. It's an auction, so if I'm willing to pay the price, I'll get it. 63 I've got, 64, 64 I pick, 64, 64. I've Price was all right. There is a margin on it, so I'm happy. First deal of the day done, but the competition's just picking up. On that first one of 110 by the first one, 110 the first one, 115, 120, 125, 130, 135, 135, 40, 145, 145, 145, 145. Outbid this time. Stephen can't afford to miss out again. Hey, this pair here. 100. I have 100 pound that pair. 100, 105. 110. 110. 110. 110. <laughs> and finally. Stephen has his fish. So the other buyer come in and bid that one box, 30 kilo, for 150 pound. But I bought the next one and a half, which is about 40 kilo, for 110 pound. And they're just as good quality. <laughs> that was crazy. Now we'll go over and see if we can get our fish sorted uh, to get out the back at 9 o'clock. It's going to be quite tight, but I'm sure we'll manage. Back out at sea, Westro still has a rope tangled in the propeller. Finally, with the nets out of the water, Skipper James can work out how to fix it. I can see it. We've got a little rope in it. It's not much, but there is something there. Stephen West, come here. Come on a minute. James consults first mate and brother, Stephen. The, uh... Deckhand Reese also comes along to help. Boat's brand new, I'm not wanting to get any damage. I just want it to fall out. You did wonder if you felt it a wee bit like... Oh, well, I was... Yeah, I just... I, well, I fan from those towing. Oh, yeah, no, because I've I, I got a few... Oh, yeah. you, you see there. Can we do anything about it? There must be a 10, 12 feet of rope there. Are you prepared to go down? Reese is offering to volunteer to dive. Well, maybe we're going to take a mark on board. We've got a swimmer. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we are. 
the end of the day, we didn't really ken that we could do to get rid of it. Ken, we've not no, no got any diving gear aboard. Ken, Reese did volunteer to go down with a wetsuit, but we just uh, thought it was better that he didn't. It. James's only option is to try and shake the rope off. Just get a wee kick. Is that slackened? It does not look like it's in amongst it's the sea. Near, it's near, it's It's through that blue. It's all one away and it stops. That's it. Through that in. Can you see it? Right at the bottom of the blade. It's getting... Oh, man. Oh, it would be a shame to come tw 10 hours into North Sea, fish for a day, then head on home. Made no money. Probably just lost some, to be honest. So. I think we'll just have to be brave. But James is James's call. Skipper's got to make all this kind of decisions. And that's kind of part of the fishing. You just things happen, and there's nearly really a set way to fix it. You just to kind of figure it out as you go along. There aren't any signs the ropes are risk, so the Westrow crew will fish on. They can't afford to waste any more time. Work on a fishing boat can be relentless. The crew are on deck up to 20 hours a day. It's been a mixed catch so far in the zenith, but there's still a chance to end the day on a high. The thrill, not knowing what you're gonna get. You're sitting here in suspense. When it's not a good haul, then you just feel like, oh crap, you just, just want to sit there with your hands in your heads, but eh. Uh, when it comes up with a good haul, it's just a rush. Just, you know, you've managed to hit the right spot, and hopefully you can do it again. The nets are bulging with prawns. Job done. Baby, scream if you want it, you're fast After a few hours sleep in her new digs, scientist Ashling is up and ready to count the prawns. I think I got the skipper's cabin this time round, so I got temperature treatment. <laughs> and uh, this is just my little cabin in here. Not the most spacious, but it'll do, and it's nice and private, so it's perfect. I'm quite used to sharing with a lot of the other guys, like, it's just the way the boats are designed. It's pretty noisy, but you kind of just get used to it. Uh, you're that tired, to be honest, that you kind of fall asleep anyway. <laughs> My mum would be killing me because she's like, you didn't make your bed! <laughs> Here we go. There's no point in making beds on board. We're going to be back in them within, like, three, four hours anyway for a couple hours sleep, so... At the beginning of the trip, you're kind of like fresh, getting on a boat, like you're good, ready to go. Um, but then, as soon as like you've done the first morning, first night, and then it's into day two, and then into day three, and day seven comes along, and you don't know what time it is. With a heap of prawns on board, Ashling can continue her survey. In this haul, I'll be doing the prawns, and part of the prawn measuring is determining whether they're male or female, and the uh, simplest way. To do that is to turn them over and have a look at their claspers. The female has really thin like um, claspers and the male has really thick ones. Time for tails. We try to measure at least 100 per category, at least. So from this haul alone, I think I'll maybe 300 prawns I'll measure. And then prawns are 24 hours, so I've got four more hauls to do. It's quite intensive. So you kind of find yourself like zoning out and it's like one, two, three, four measures, like nice four measures. It can get you down some days of repetitiveness of the job, but you kind of know what you're going to be doing each day. You get used to it and you get it done as quick as you can. <laughs> then you head straight to bed. <laughs> Working on shore can also mean long hours. Lovely smoked haddock, big smoked haddock. Fishmonger Stephen has been up since four, ordering and buying fish to sell in his van. Big lemon sole, great quality, lovely halibut. And this is a monk fish. He must quickly fill it, sort and pack the seafood for his first stop of the day. With customers waiting, he can't afford to be late. I was happy with the prices today. I was. A lemon sole cost you around about £3 an hour. I mean, when you think that was aboard the boat, 
Okay, maybe about an hour and a half ago. We're we'll kind of getting you fresher than that, really. That's it. Time to go. Just five past nine, so we're not too bad. First stop, a village just outside Peterhead. Hiya. Right, near bother at all. Stephen has some regular customers here, but he never knows how many of them will turn up. Oh, he's a smile, you know. <laughs> Back to the door. Okay. <laughs> Every day, he has to try and balance supply with demand. Thank you. Okay, see you. Oh, it was good. Really busy, actually. A number of people, regular customers, and a few uh, new customers as well. It's never been a long. Good start today. With nine more villages to visit today, and a van full of fish to sell, there's no time to waste. A lot of folk will say he's rushing, but may I have to, can it? And your timing is so crucial. Stephen uses social media to let his customers know when he'll be in town. No, this is where Betty. <laughs> Betty goes on to social media every morning, usually. So you was on my Facebook this yes, morning? Yes, definitely, of course. <laughs> <laughs> First thing I choose the morning, Stephen, to make sure you're coming. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. That's right, Betty, what are you after? Six lemon soul. Betty's one of my best customers, I'm telling you. He's not just a fish man, he's a friend. <laughs> and I can put that with Stephen Stoke. I'm near in ten and stop and no. anytime soon. <laughs> Thanks, Stephen. See you later. On the Zenith, it's been a successful few days for Adam, but experience is telling him it's time to move on. It's just an area you only get maybe three days max out of the ending. It'll just go away to nothing, and I just seen it there were last all there, was, there wasn't much there, so I just thought we'd go in because it was only 15 miles, the land's still fresh. It's just a short sail back to harbour, so the race is on for Ashling. Fast haul, under a bit of time pressure because we don't have um, much time before we get back to the harbour. So these guys are working quick, so I have to work quick too. This will be the end of the trip for Ashling. She has to send her research back to the lab. Sometimes it's hard to find space on a boat to do work, but there's plenty of space on board here, so it's, I can, I've got no excuses. I have to crack on with the, the fun side of the job, of any job, paperwork. All the information is collected together and analysed, and essentially it goes towards like determining the stocks and the total allowable catch for the future years. And what we just kind of aim to do is just try to show how productive Scotland's seas are. and um, how important that is for the fishing industry and why it's important for us to actually get out on fishing vessels. I would say her role is really beneficial. We should get the stats and the figures from what she's taken. We can maybe tell you the difference between people guessing that a stock's maybe just on its way to collapse than being actually healthy. It's always nice coming back from a trip and seeing the coastline, because you know you're coming home. OK, thank you. All right. Next customer. On shore, former fisherman Stephen Bruce has also had a successful day selling fish all over Aberdeenshire. Sometimes and it fishing, if when you cast away your net, you don't care if you're got to, sometimes if you're gonna get a good haul or not, and it's just the same with this. When you go out in the morning, you don't care if you're gonna be busy or no. No, it's been a good day. I've had a lot of uh, new customers, sold a lot of fish. That's it. Last order of the day. Haddock and smoked haddock for fish cakes. After a short sail. The Zenith is arriving home in Fraserburgh, but when the fishing is good, there's no time to rest. Yeah, always is nice to get back to shore. I mean, uh, it'd be nicer if I was going home, but we're just coming out of land and going back out again, so I just have to suck it up for a few days.
truck or something. They got the... Uh, what do you all right for 12 days? 179 boxes. You mate. Adam has landed a big bounty, but the West Throw is lagging behind. They're just about breaking even on their expenses. Far from good enough when you have a two million pound boat to pay for. Oh, I'll sleep easy. We get a 15 plus of bronze tonight. I'm over for 20, though. You never know what's happening. This is always exciting, but all these are it. Just tense until we see it coming up. Hopefully, we're on the money. I think it's slightly better, but I'm not sure. Hope so. Go for the hydraulics. Yeah. Yes. That's the best hauler trip by far. Maybe have 16, 17 oh. bucks up front, so happy lads tonight. Finally, the Westro has some prawns on board, but time is running out on this trip. Down here, this is like our bunk vault here. This is where everything we catch for the week we store it. Once the prawns is catched. You've maybe got seven to ten days to get them to the buyer, and then uh, they're spoiled. So the clock's ticking. As soon as the first ones come on board, you've, you've got to be quick. But as you can see, there's an awful lot of empty boxes over there still to be full. Next time, the Westro runs into trouble in the North Sea as they try and turn their luck around. You see all the mud? It's teaming out the cord ends. That's a waste of drag. That's a proper embarrassment. And a rookie on the ocean endeavor gets to grips with life at sea. Whoa, whoa, whoa! His brain stopped functioning. 